I once read a quote by Agatha Christie that said, one of the luckiest things that can happen to you in life, I think, is to have a happy childhood. Well, I spent my childhood here, in the Serbian province of Kosovo and Metohija, in the heart of Europe. Now, the name Kosovo comes from the Serbian word for blackbird, or kos, while the name Metohija comes from the multitude of monasteries and churches in the region called Metos during the Middle Ages. Simply put, the name says it all. Natural beauty and great spiritual heritage. But since the 14th century and the Battle of Kosovo that took place here between the Serbian army and the Ottoman Empire, this entire region came under Turkish rule, which started a period of destruction. Centuries have passed, bringing many changes. But if you think that our survival is no longer in question, think again. Most people are aware of the heinous destruction of civilizational heritage in the Middle East, but few people know that those things are also happening in Europe now, just like they did in the past. A ray of hope that our heritage would no longer be in danger appeared when it was placed under the protection of UNESCO. Now this should have marked the beginning of a period of rehabilitation and the restoration of many important buildings. But instead, history is repeating itself, with a new danger emerging from old destroyers. Nowadays, people rely on various social and political institutions. For example, our children's education depends on what the government decides on that. Our finances depend on currency circulating in our economic system and our security is threatened or isn't, depending on how the authorities deal with the matter. But this region has been teaching us for centuries that an entire nation can survive on something that many of us, perhaps, don't even appreciate enough. Here, there is a nation that has been rising, suffering, but surviving for a millennium under many political, social and historical circumstances thanks only to its values. Values such as love, faith and hope, which are transmitted through culture, religion and tradition. I know it sounds a bit vague, but in the world we live in today, a world full of hatred, mistrust and apathy, such living values are the only alternative to the evils we are faced with. And these evils can easily prevail. Throughout history, our civilization has had many downs. Just look at Nazi Germany or the rise of ISIS. But in such horrible times, History can show us the path towards the right values, values such as equality for all and freedom. Monasteries are places that embody such values. The monasteries in Kosovo and Metohija, which are now UNESCO heritage sites, are what mankind has built for centuries through one nation, the Serbian nation, to show us the right path. The monastic life, its ancient rules of life carry a sort of code a recipe for the finest human values that have been built into civilization itself, so that when we're in troubling times, we can re-establish these values and rise up from the abyss. My name is Stefan Popovic. I was born and raised in Yugoslavia, in one of its republics, Serbia, in a region that's historically seen as Kosovo and Metohija. The socialist system in Yugoslavia, focusing on the middle class, meant that the majority didn't have many expensive things, but generally we had a happy childhood. There was enough security to set free a child's imagination. 
while beautiful landscapes and the rich cultural and historical heritage were such that they communicated the right values to us as we grew up. Hardworking, good and friendly people with amazing monasteries and great spirituality were certainly more than enough that I could ask for anybody. A happy childhood and great values. Coming here for the first time after many years of living abroad, really brings back a lot of memories. Seeing kids playing the way we did, communicating through laughter about the rules of the games in the churchyard. As kids, we had no idea just how difficult it was for the monastery of Gracanica to survive and how difficult it still is today. It's such a powerful feeling being here in front of this building, which bears witness to so many centuries and to what the centuries have to say to us. As a child, I was playing on grounds where the first Christian church was built in the 8th century. The Serbian medieval ruler who built most of the endowments here is King Milutin. In the area where there used to be a Byzantine basilica, he built the monastery in 1321. And after centuries of destruction, out of the whole monastery complex, only this church remained, the Dormition of the Mother of God. This red brick, for instance, one can only imagine the stories that it has to tell. And the fact that something's still standing after 700 years really says something about its living value. Now, our kids' game only stopped during service, when our parents gathered us in the yard and then took us into the festive ambience in the centre of the temple. Tired from running, we'd slowly calm down and our curious eyes wandered to the scenes on the walls. The most advanced techniques for painting frescoes in Serbian medieval art were actually used in this temple. Now the mural painting is applied to the fresh plaster rather than being applied later when the plaster is dry, so the painting actually becomes an integral part of the wall. If you look at the highest spot in the church, you see a fresco of Christ, the creator of everything in Christianity. Now this is typical for Orthodox temples even today and it represents the creative and protective vision of Christ himself. Now on the tops of the small domes in the sign of a cross, the gospel writers themselves were actually painted. Now the purpose of this was to serve as an ongoing reminder to Christians to continue to spread the word of the resurrection and of the life of Christ himself. You might also recognize characters from the Old Testament, holidays that are related to the earthly life of Christ and the biggest feast of the patron of the temple the Assumption of Virgin Mary. There is also an interesting painting representing the Last Judgment. Now the fresco itself was created in approximately 1320. In Christianity, the Last Judgment represents a moment of general resurrection and a reward for the righteous. We can see paintings of rulers and donors who demonstrated values in the Christian way of life. Byzantine Emperor Constantine, who in the fourth century allowed by decree the Christian religion and in doing so, stopped the persecution and the killing of Christians. Now, Byzantine Emperor Constantine was actually born on the territory of what is today the wonderful city of Nish in Serbia. Behind me, the founder, King Milutin. Now, the purpose of these murals was to guide the faithful to care for and preserve these sites in the same way that those who built them did. And when you understand that, you'll understand the centuries-old Serbian commitment to taking care of them. All frescoes and icons in Orthodox teaching have an active role in prayer. But so does singing. In Orthodoxy, it's one of the most striking things that characterise prayer. Singing helps to revive the icons. And I know that it sounds strange, but now that I'm here, I can actually feel the vibrations from centuries old singing in this church and even see the sparkle off some of the icons on the walls. Vibrant colours lift them from the walls. Alive and active, they continue the action in which they were captured by the painter. The carriage of the last judgement continues riding on the sea. And Christ, surrounded by angels, spreading his arms wider and wider. Now there was one icon that always scared me. 
Her beauty sparked my attention, but her eyes told me something very different about her fate. There was always something unsettling about this depiction of Queen Simonida. She was born a Byzantine princess, but it was war, not royalty, that determined her life. The civil war in the Byzantine Empire during the 13th century put the Byzantine Emperor in a hopeless situation, and the only way out was a strong alliance with the increasingly powerful Serbian kingdom in the north. Thus, he gave his only daughter's hand in marriage to Serbian King Milutin, even though she was only 12 years old. Despite opposition of the Serbian nobility and the Patriarch of Constantinople, the political marriage was final. Her sacrifice shows how here, at the crossroads of civilization, peace was always expensive. The Serbian nation to this day has great respect for Simonida and for her sacrifice. But what struck me as a child were the eyes on the fresco. They were gouged out with a sharp object by an Albanian or an Ottoman soldier. This act of vandalism attracted the attention of Serbian poet Milan Rakic. Deeply moved by this act, he wrote a poem about the youngest Serbian queen. Your eyes were gouged out, O beautiful image, on a pilaster at approach of night, knowing that no one would witness the pillage, an Albanian's knife robbed you of your sight. But neither your mouth nor your noble face to desecrate with his hand did he dare, or touch your golden crown or queenly lace beneath which lay your luxuriant hair. Now, in the church, upon the stone pilaster, serenely bearing your tormented plight, dressed in the robes of mosaic and luster, I see you sad and dignified in white. Like stars extinguished in the distant past, which yet transmit to men the far-off glow, so that men see the light, the hue, the cast, of stars lost to sight a long time ago. Today, upon me from your royal height, from that antique stone covered all in grime, O oh, sad Simonida shines down the light of eyes gouged sightless in another time. A sad poem with a beautiful ending. It talks about art and its greatness in conquering violence and war. It's interesting that the Kosovo Albanian authorities deny any connection with the destruction and violence against UNESCO heritage throughout history. They claim that destruction is a part of something that is historically distant and irrelevant today. But today, in a time of declared peace, Kosovo Albanian institutions have banned this song. They've banned a song that talks about the desecration and destruction of our cultural heritage. This is evidence of an intent to wipe out the existence and the values of the Serbian people in Kosovo. If one poem is banned because of these intentions, what could happen to the monasteries that are living examples of the Serbian existence? And can the world allow the destruction and the wiping out of our civilizational achievements? always loved the mild winters and the hot summers. After every Christmas, we'd come here to the southern town of Prizren to visit relatives. My relatives would always make sure that we'd stay for a few days. Now, one of the things that makes Prizren so unique is the specific microclimate that adds a special touch to the food and wine found in all Prizren homes. The bridges on the Bistrica River, the impressive architecture of this city at the foot of the Shar Mountain, leaves any visitor in awe. But for us kids, this was our playground for hide and seek. Now, like I said before, this region of Metochia actually took its name from a word meaning church property. Now, one of the most beautiful churches in this region is actually located in a canyon of a clear water creek, where when the wind passes over the water, it literally brings with it a breath of fresh air. These kinds of natural conditions attracted human settlements since ancient times. 
Later, the Byzantines left their mark here and had great significance for the Serbian medieval state, starting from the Serbian medieval rulers Kings Stefan Nemanja, Milutin, Dusan and Uroš. Prizren was becoming an increasingly important commercial centre where merchants from across the Balkans came and settled. In the Middle Ages, the economic boom was followed by a period of extensive spiritual and cultural construction. Thus, the Church of Our Lady of Ljevish, the Monastery of the Holy Archangels behind me, and the Church of the Holy Saviour, as well as the Church of the Holy Sunday, were all built for the faithful in Prizren during this period. As the city fell under Ottoman rule in the mid-15th century, this type of construction ceased, and the following period was one of destruction of monuments and buildings. Wonder why this mosque has the sign of a cross in the stone that was used to build it? Well, wonder no more. It's because Sinan Pasha, who actually built the mosque, used the ruins of the Holy Archangel's monastery to build it. On the other hand, the entire church building of Our Lady of Yevish was transformed into a mosque. Now, it wasn't until the late 19th century that a slight renewal of Christian culture started with the construction of the President's Seminary. Prizren once again became a part of Serbia between 1912 and 1913. But Serbia left the entire territory while fighting alongside the Allies in World War I, and it re-established control over the city in 1918. Before the outbreak of war in the late 1990s, fought between the Yugoslav army and Albanian guerrilla forces, there were around 10,000 Serbs living right here in Prizren. Today, there are barely a handful. One of these Serbian homes belonged to my relatives that we used to come and visit here. We went to church every Sunday, and the closest church was right behind me, the Church of Our Lady of Ljevish. Cheerful sounds of people conversing on the way to church are now replaced by silence guarded by security forces. Children's games are now replaced by wires, and aside from the church itself, the scenery is almost unrecognisable. The church is the only thing preserving the testimony of those beautiful times when prison was shining and the warm memories of the winter days of my childhood. Shortly after his marriage to Byzantine Princess Simonida, Serbian King Milutin began renovating the Byzantine Basilica, which had been there since the 10th century. With renovation, the church obtained the form of a cross, modelled after a Byzantine cathedral. The church itself, named after the icon of the Virgin Mary from the city of Ljevish, is one of the most beautiful buildings of old Serbian architecture. It was built by the already mentioned king of the Serbian medieval dynasty, Milutin Nemanjic. Construction was completed in approximately 1306. But what's particularly interesting about this church is that at the entrance, the inscriptions of the builder and the fresco painter are preserved. The frescoes of this church are complex and rich. The greatness of the space allowed numerous cycles and individual figures to be painted. As the church is dedicated to the Virgin, her presence is increasingly expressed on the paintings. The oldest layers belong to the frescoes at the southern part of the temple. Two representations of Christ's miracles, such as the wedding at Cana at Galilee and Christ healing the blind. This is the fresco of the Virgin with Christ the Protector. Now the first two are stored at the Gallery of Frescoes in Belgrade because of their vulnerability, while the Virgin and Elusa are here in the southern part of the temple. The remaining frescoes are from the period of the 14th century. This part belongs to work under the auspices of King Milutin. Among them are the cycles of great festivities, the Passion of the Christ, his miracles, portraits of saints, and Serbian historical figures. This fresco represents Christ as the guardian of Prizren. As you can see, it too has been heavily damaged. Isn't it strange? A citizen of Prizren attacking the protector of his own town. In the bell tower, there are parables about transience and vanity of earthly life that are illustrated. Now, unfortunately, in March 2004, during the pogrom in Kosovo and Metohija, the bell tower was heavily damaged by fire. As a result, since then, the bell has collapsed, preventing us from accessing the bell tower and preventing anyone from hearing or seeing the stories that it has to tell. 
The wonderful city of Prizren, from my memories, an imperial city full of light and splendor, is now the site of sad scenes of desecration of icons. So much anger and demolition inflicted upon these wonderful monuments so that Serbs and their culture in this region would be erased. It's crucial to understand that this was much more than simply a case of material destruction. Because whoever was trying to destroy these frescoes was also trying to destroy the stories they tell. And given that the stories are so deeply embedded in this plaster, imagine the level of rage that was required to be unleashed to destroy all of this. The struggle of beauty against hate, culture against politics. Tragic. In the 18th century, the church of Our Lady of Ljevish was turned into a mosque. Now, since Islam doesn't allow any paintings or any physical representation of God, and the icons bothered the believers while praying, they came up with a solution by covering them with plaster and calcs. They tried everything, but the outlines of the frescoes remained. Out of anger and despair, they left these notches. The pinnacle of luxury and artistic impression of a civilizational epoch was hidden under an impersonal layer. In the 1950s, a restoration rediscovered them to the world and mass copies of the icon of the Virgin of Ljevish traveled the world and became part of European and world culture. As one of the participants of this project said, we just released a prisoner and helped him recover. The discoveries of the 1950s marked a time of hope that this medieval treasure would be treated as such. But this enthusiasm was diminished in the worst possible way in less than half a century. Starting from 1999, the church was set on fire and the icons were badly damaged. During the 2004 pogrom, about 150 square meters of the lead roof was stolen just like what happened several centuries before to Gracanica. These monuments have been through so much, covered and hidden, set on fire, desecrated, stolen. Their cultural meaning is indeed eternal, but they themselves, unfortunately, are not. Coming back here really brings up old memories. You know how you can get flashbacks from a specific scent? For me, this is usually the case when it comes to food here. It has all the flavors that adorn this area. I can still remember the smell that was waiting for us on the table as we'd run home and the church bells were still resonating after liturgy. And the best thing about a meal that was as tasty as this, it meant that it was very easy to eat very quickly, which meant I could get straight back out and play games with my friends in the narrow streets of the city. A wonderful microclimate, tasty wine, and lovely aromatic dishes should make this area a calm and peaceful place. Sadly, this doesn't ease the political tensions and destructive desires of some. By losing one ethnic group, the Serbs, Prizren lost everything that every nation in the world has as its own, its culture and its traditions. And all this happened as the world stood by and allowed it to happen. I'm walking along the Rugova Gorge, powered by the Pech Bistrica River, towards the monastery of the Patriarchate of Pech. Now, the seat of the first Serbian Archbishop used to be in a monastery called Žica, but when it was threatened at one point, it was relocated to a then safer part of the country, Pech. Since the beginning of the 13th century, in about 100 years, this amazing complex of several churches was built. The spirit of the Serbian people was incorporated into the construction which reflects its incredible desire to preserve their Christian faith and identity. It is this commitment that will put history on trial. Before the war, I used to come with my father to the Slava, or celebration of the patron saint of the monastery in Pech. It is the feast of the Virgin of Protection. The sound of the Bistrica River was a cheerful soundtrack on our way to the monastery. I drank water from this small, clean river so many times as a child. Now, 
there's barbed wire. So many times we'd run from our parents to the monastery yard, totally carried away in our games. Now there are high walls and security forces. Only the building of the monastery and the nuns are recognisable to me. Centuries-old efforts of the Serbian people to safeguard their spiritual capital in a secure place resulted in this beautiful complex. The Church of the Holy Apostles, which I'm standing in now, was built in the first half of the 13th century and it belongs to the monuments of the Rashka school. It's also the oldest church in the complex of the Pech Patriarchate. Painted with these marvellous frescoes, the Church of the Holy Apostles represents a unique link between the Serbian and Byzantine styles of architecture. The frescoes from the church indicate a significant artistic achievement of the Serbian painting from the 13th century. One of the most important is the representation of Christ on the throne to whom the Virgin and John the Baptist address the prayers on behalf of mankind. There were also some frescoes added in the 17th century and the altar was built in the 18th century. The Church of St. Demetrius and the Holy Virgin have a number of characteristics of buildings built in the 14th century. It is a building of the Serbian Byzantine school with the foundation in the shape of a cross built with stones and bricks. The chapel of St. Nicholas was erected along the southern facade of the Church of the Virgin. Now as you can see, it's a very small building, but it's dedicated to one of the most revered saints in the Serbian nation. In this building of simple architecture, we can find a preserved painted cycle dedicated to St. Nicholas. Now these murals created in the second half of the 17th century are very, very well preserved. St. Nicholas is considered the patron of travellers and sailors and is the largest slava, or holiday, a tradition linked to the Serbian people. Several founders, a large number of builders and artists and centuries of believers who keep trying to build, preserve and extend this beautiful building represent the unbreakable bond between a people and their holy shrines. Now this statement takes on a whole new meaning if you get a quick history lesson in the monastery and the circumstances that surround it. Ever since the moving of the headquarters of the Archdiocese, Pech became a very important place of the medieval Serbian state. It was the first seat of the Archbishop, then a Patriarchate. The Patriarch, from the Orthodox perspective, is considered the spiritual father of a nation and linking this to the monastery of Pech made the monastery itself the spiritual centre for Serbs. After the Battle of Kosovo in 1389, Turkish authorities started controlling this region up until the early 20th century. With the fall of Constantinople, Christian influence in this part of Europe became negligible. This was a time of darkness and silence. But the constant desire of Serbs to restore the shine of Pech never died. Instead, it was handed down from generation to generation. The damaged churches of Pech were maybe hoping that the 20th century would bring healing and peace. But a fire in 1981 was an indication that this century and the next had yet more scars to add to Pech. It's sad to look at such destruction, especially if you consider that there's a document from the late 17th century that has a list of Serbian contributors for the restoration of the Patriarchate of Pech. Now these were people who were already heavily burdened with taxes as Christians, and it was mainly peasants who were the poorest who were contributing. Now it's interesting because many of these people had never been to the monastery, which shows the desire to preserve something in the collective consciousness of a nation. In the 18th century, the seat of the Serbian Patriarchate was relocated from Pech. 
So why did Serbs invest heavily and risk their safety in order to restore this very monastery in Pech? Well, it's because of the very spiritual message of this place. The chair of St. Sava, the nobleman who gave away his title and devoted himself to monastic life. An undisputed example in Serbian history of love for the arts, literacy and spiritual elevation. Sarcophagi of those who devoted their lives to this beautiful building, to its construction, to its preservation, continue to serve as both an example and an inspiration to others. Also, we have the nuns, who live isolated and encircled by a wall at whose gates security guards stand. They preserve the monastery of Pech with their presence and protect what's inside these walls from the surrounding population. The danger of the political aspirations of the provisional institutions in Pristina is ever present, as they yearn to turn this living building into a dead monument. It would then only be a witness of a time gone by, instead of being a living messenger in the present. Can we really allow this to happen? There are some places in the world that are unusual, inexplicable and eternal, and they owe their eternity to those who have been lucky enough to experience these qualities. One such place is the monastery of Visoki Dechani. The grandeur and beauty that the builders incorporated into it is enough to attract you, but what one experiences in them can't be explained in a rational way. The miracles experienced in the monastery are told by visitors, regardless of nationality or religion. My name is Eleonora, I'm Italian. My name is Valerio, I'm Italian too. And uh, I and uh, she, we came here to this great Serbian monastery of Visokidecini because we heard uh, a lot of great and fantastic things about the monastery. And now that we are here, we can actually testify that it's great and it's important not only for the Serbian heritage, but also for the world's one. Visoki Dečani Monastery is one of the most important uh, uh, cultural and religious sites in the Balkans. Uh, we can speak about different layers of cultural and religious heritage. This uh, monastery as well as other uh, well cultural heritage sites in Kosovo, they have particular meaning for the Serbian people and Serbian Orthodox Church and are an important part of our history. On the other hand, um, they are important for all people who live in this region and the cultural heritage is meant to bring people together, to help them abridge their uh, differences and uh, find meaning in sharing something beautiful and valuable. On the third level, it is the World Cultural Heritage Site and it is of importance for all humanity. I came to Dechani for the first time before the war in 1999. It was a Sunday morning and my friends and I came to the liturgy in the monastery. The plains of Mithokia were bathed in the morning sun and my friends and I, well, we were greeted by the sounds of church bells. The beauty of the hills and forests was cut by the silhouette of the monastery church. The luxury of the environment leaves you speechless even after so many centuries. The constructor's attention to detail can be seen every step of the way in the selection of the construction site, the architectural design, and even in the facade itself. A complete environment where nothing can be taken nor added points to the beauty of a pearl. And by that definition, Visuki Dechani is the pearl of Metochia. Gregory Tamblak, a medieval writer and church leader, wrote about the place as rich in forests and pastures with clear water, which he called sweet. And he also described the air as healthy and fresh. The founder of the monastery was actually a descendant of the Serbian medieval dynasty Nemanjic Stefan Uroš III. Now construction of the Church of Christ Pantocrator actually began in 1327. The main artisan was Master Vito from Kotor who was actually a Catholic monk. And the church was so tall that the word tall or visoki in Serbian actually became a part of its name. Now the symbolic gesture of the founder building the cornerstone and then richly donating the monastery by charter is a special and a personal example of the special connection that exists with Stefan Uroš III, who later became known as Stefan of Dechani, named after the city of Dechani not far from here. 
His son, Dusan Nemic, completed the construction in 1335, and 10 years later, it was painted. Though buildings in Serbia at the time were made out of brick and stone, according to the Byzantine tradition, Bečani reminds of a Romanesque basilica in its outward appearance. For decades, various craftsmen came from the east and from the west in order to cut the stone and decorate this beautiful edifice. Mixing Byzantine cultures from the east and already developed Romanesque from the west gave an amazing outcome that's standing before you. Admiration for the beauty of the exterior of this building is only a prelude to what leaves you speechless when you enter the monastery. Around 10,000 individual characters placed in approximately 20 units present the most important moments in Christian teachings. And as an artistic whole, it's very impressive. For the first time, certain objects of medieval life are shown here, as well as kings themselves, presented without flattering them and their authority or power. Very little is known about the names of the painters. The way they worked on these paintings it makes me imagine the huge wooden medieval scaffolding with all of the artists and the assistants that were standing on top of it. The painters were under immense pressure to work quickly, so they pushed themselves to their fullest and then even tried to go a step further. This step further made by the painters was a step further for all of art. Seeing the beauty and importance of his work and no doubt feeling a sense of pride in what he'd just accomplished, one of them timidly signed it. Miracles, as incredible and inexplicable events, are part of Orthodox life. But what is interesting about Bechani are the testimonies of members of other religions about these incredible events. Monks who passed away in the monastery were buried here, behind the altar. And they were buried in the ground with gravestones that list their name and their age. So we see the names of monks from Russia, guardians of treasure. And then we see one name that stands out from the rest, Yaakov Ibrahim. Now this name suggests a different ethnic background, yet it stands in the same line with the rest of the monks. Through his way of life, he proved his values, which mattered more than his origin. And this is one of the many things that shows us the beauty and the attractiveness of life in the monastery of Visoki Dechani. You'd think that the reputation and respect that Bechani inspired in all religions would mean more security for it. But history teaches us something else. The politics that has often been manifested by war and destruction in this region reflected its worst sides since the Battle of Kosovo, which took place only a few decades after the construction of the monastery was completed, and it continues to this day. For centuries, without a way for Serbia to protect it, the monastery was left to itself in a hostile environment to such an extent that its survival can only be attributed to the incredible tale of the appearance of the founder, Stefan of Dechani. A Turkish soldier who was on guard all alone one night saw an old man with a long grey beard approaching. Now the Turkish soldier was afraid of attacks from other armies, so naturally he was afraid of the old man. But as the old man came closer, he told the soldier not to be afraid and that no one would harm him while he was here. And as quickly as he appeared, he then disappeared into the night. Now the Turkish soldier kept this experience to himself, presumably not wanting to be mocked by others when he told them of this experience. Then another soldier on guard the next night had the same experience with the same old man, as did a third soldier on guard the night after. Now what's really interesting is that all of these guards kept this experience to themselves, presumably for the same reason. But then one night, the three guards found themselves in the same conversation, and the worried expression on one of their faces gave them away, to the point where he had to reveal his experience to the other two. Then the other two revealed to him that they'd had the same experience with the same old man. Peace to those who come to Dechani in good faith. That was the message from the old man, and one that he gave to each of the soldiers on their respective nights. And that man was believed to be the founder of the monastery, Stefan Uros. And it's a message that remains to this day. The Turkish era was characterized by lootings and a harsh struggle for survival. The rough times didn't end after the Turks left. 
even the relics of Stefan of Decheny were in danger of being carried out from the monastery by Bulgarian soldiers during World War I. But they were returned to the monastery thanks to the fact that the vehicle that was transporting them broke down. Pretty extraordinary circumstances. After so many dangers facing Decheny, there was one more that would come after the war in 1999, and it continues to this day. For 11 weeks in 1999, NATO bombed Serbia to take control over its southern province, with the Kosovo Albanians using the opportunity to wipe out all Serbs from the province, threatening and attacking even what belongs to all of mankind. Since the conflict uh, in 1999, Decheny Monastery suffered four armed attacks by local Kosovo Albanian extremists. Uh, these were three mortar attacks and a um, RPG, rocket propelled grenade attack. The last was in 2007. Last year, in January, uh, four armed um, religious extremists um, with connections to ISIS uh, were arrested in front of the monastery. They were armed. All this is a reason why the protection of the monastery by K4 peacekeepers is essentially important for its future. If I had to describe Visoki Dechen in one sentence, it attracts everyone with its beauty, tranquility and spirituality. History has been so cruel to this monastery that at times it's had to rely solely on miracles to survive. What we're facing now though is something new. An ugly product of the 20th century was a political desire to remove one ethnic group, the Serbs, from a geographical area, physically, culturally, and spiritually. Visoki Decheni is a monument of world cultural significance, guarded by Serbs for all of mankind. But the essence of this preservation is called into question by politics that's only focused on its short-term interests. Could the world afford to lose something that still has so much to teach future generations. This is not just um, a religious site and a world cultural heritage site. This is first of all our home, the monastery that has uninterrupted history of 700 years of monastic life. And uh, we are deeply committed uh, to stay here and uh, witness, first of all, our Christian faith but also be a factor of peace and reconciliation among different people as we were. Kosovo is not only my childhood, but really a part of civilization's childhood. One cannot leave Kosovo, just like one can't get away from any civilizational achievement or wonder of the world. The world in which we live doesn't really look like the sort of place that we'd like to leave for our children. It seems like we forgot at some point that everything that's good comes from somewhere. But so does everything that's evil. For generations we nurtured the best of human creation in order to integrate its good sides into a system of values that would work for today and the future. Now the monasteries of Kosovo and Metokia are of great importance to human creativity. And then it makes sense that they were then put under the protection of UNESCO. Now the challenges that these monasteries and churches have faced over the centuries are reflected today. Since 1999, more than 150 churches and monasteries were destroyed by Albanian extremists. And the motive for this destruction is the need to erase every trace of the Serbian ethnic group from this territory for political reasons, as Kosovo Albanian politicians attempt to create an ethnically pure state. And it's working. In the last 30 years, the number of Serbs in Kosovo and Metohija has decreased tenfold and cemeteries where Serbs are buried are regularly desecrated and destroyed. The attacks on our people and our monasteries are ongoing. Kosovo authorities say that they want to protect these sites, but it seems that not even NATO believes them because K4 troops are actually mandated to protect these sites from Kosovo Albanians. World cultural heritage sites must not be put in the hands of those from whom they are being protected. UNESCO must not allow that these sites these cultural and these civilizational achievements which were given to the world through the Serbs be lost so that they can only be read about in books rather than be seen and experienced. UNESCO still has a chance to stand on the right side of civilization. Or they can side with the dark political project, the so-called Republic of Kosovo, which attempts to extinguish the voices of the past. And if we lose the voices of the past, we will lose ourselves in the future.